Hey guys, welcome. Today I want to show you how you can set up this simple 2D platformer scene from scratch in Unity. All of the assets that you see will be provided to you, and this will work with a keyboard and mouse as well as a gamepad. So we're going to start with a new project. We're going to select 2D Universal Render Pipeline. We're not going for AAA graphics here, so this is going to be perfect for us. Okay, so I prefer to work in the 2 by 3 space and drag this over here. Let's start by getting some assets in there right away. Let's create a folder called Sprites. And again, the link for these sprites is in the description below. So you can go inside and go into Player and drag that into the hierarchy here. So one thing that you want to make sure of is if you select character here and over in the inspector panel over here, you want to go down to character rig and make sure that the pivot point is set to center or that's going to cause you problems later on. Next, let's open this up, right click, and we're going to unpack it so that it's not a prefab anymore. And let's parent the head to the body by dragging that on top of body. This way we're free to move the body, but the head will also follow, but we are also free to just move the head by itself. This will come in handy for animating later on. Let's also go into the background and just drag background plane on there so it's a little less boring. And let's also go into environment asset, platforms. So we're gonna need to cut these up because these are multiple sprites. So let's go over here, make sure that multiple is selected and go to sprite editor. And in here, you're free to just zoom and drag around and you can just select these as closely as you need to. You can just drag these blue lines here to expand your selection. All right, once that's done, you should be able to select all three of them individually like this, hit apply. You'll know that you did it right if you drag this down and now you see platforms 0, 1, and 2. Let's drag the biggest one into the scene. And if you're not seeing it, that's because of the order in layers. So what we actually want to do is go over to background and set this to something really low, like negative 50. That'll make sure that everything else in the scene is drawn on top of the background. Let's drag the character down a bit, as well as the floor. Rename this to floor. Now let's get the character interacting with the environment. And so to do that, we need to implement physics. So first off, we are going to go to our character and we're gonna add a rigid body 2D component. What that's gonna do is give us gravity. So if I hit play, you'll see that the character falls. But he falls through the floor because we don't have any collisions set up yet. So let's get those set up now. Add a box collider 2D to your character. It likely won't fit properly at first. So go ahead and click edit collider here and you can just expand this as needed. If these gizmos are in your way of being able to see in the scene view, go ahead and just click this here to make them disappear. Okay, perfect. We also need to add a box collider 2D to the floor. And if you cut that up nice and tightly in the sprite editor, then it should fit perfectly already. So now if you hit play, you should see that the character actually lands on the floor and stays there. Because this is our main character, we also want to change collision detection from discrete to continuous. That's just going to check for collisions more often. It's a little more resource intensive, but it's something that you're going to want for your main character. We're also going to open up constraints and freeze the rotation on the Z axis. This is usually more of a problem if you have a capsule collider, but you want to make sure that you're not getting your player rotating like this as you're moving him around. So we're just going to lock that up. All right, next we're going to get controls set up and I want this to work with keyboard and with a gamepad and we want it to be as easy as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to window and open the package manager. Change this drop down up here to Unity Registry and scroll down until you find input system right here. We're going to install that. If you get this box, just click yes to restart the editor. All right, great. Let's get those set up. Create a new folder in the root assets folder called scripts. Open that up and let's create another one so that we're organized and call it input. In there, let's right click and go to create and scroll down until you find input actions. Let's call it controls. And up here, click this generate C sharp class and click apply. That's going to create a class in here. And now click this edit asset button and let's dock it over here beside our scene view. Let's start by creating a control scheme called keyboard. And if you have a gamepad, go ahead and click Add Control Scheme Gamepad. 
change this back to all control schemes here so that we can apply both of them at once. Now, regardless of whether or not you have a gamepad, everything in the action maps here is going to remain the same. The only thing that will change is our actual actions in here. So let's start by creating an action map called movement. Rename this action to move. And we're going to change the action type to a pass through and make the control type a vector two. Now you can click on this button here and add an up, down, left, right composite. Go ahead and delete this binding here. Let's call this one WASD for up. Click here and you can click listen to make this easy. Just click that, hit the W key, and we'll add that to our keyboard control scheme. And let's go through the rest really quick. Let's add another one for our arrow keys. Okay, I just connected my Xbox 360 controller. We're going to add another up, down, left, right composite. We'll call this analog. And it's gonna work exactly the same. You click here, click listen, hit up on your gamepad, and find left stick up. And we'll add that to our gamepad control scheme. And let's do the rest really quick. And we'll do the same for the D-pad. Last thing we're going to do is change all four of these from digital normalized to digital. What you'll notice with digital normalized is that actually if you're holding a direction on your gamepad, like you're wanting to move to the right and it's going slightly up as well, it's actually going to slow down your movement speed. You might want this for a top-down game, but you don't want this for a 2D platformer. When you're ready, go ahead and click save asset up here. It's very important. Now that we've created our control class and it's all set up the way that we want it, we actually need to set up the script that actually listens for our input. So let's do that now. Right click and create a new C-sharp script called user input. So go ahead and delete all of this startup stuff. And we're actually going to turn this into a singleton class. And you may or may not know what that means, but we'll see what it actually does later on. And it's actually a really great way to be able to make things stay persistent even between scenes in your game. So if you want to be able to keep a game object in your game from one scene into the next when you load a new scene, this is one of the ways that you can do it. We're going to create a public static user input and call it instance. Then in our awake function, if instance is equal to null, then the instance is equal to this. And then we'll call don't destroy on load, which is, this is the thing that'll actually keep it persistent in between scenes. Else, meaning if instance does not equal null, then we're going to actually destroy this game object. And that's because this is going to be a singleton really literally meaning we only ever want to have one of these in our scene ever and if there's another one we're going to destroy it next we need to grab a reference to our controls that we just set up so we're going to create a public controls called controls and we don't want this to show up in the inspector so let's go ahead over here and add hide in inspector so that it's still public but we don't need to see it in the inspector and down here in the awake function, we're going to say controls are equal to new controls. Next, we want to create a public of type vector2 called move input. And this is going to represent the value that our controls actually pass in. If you press left on your gamepad, then it's going to pass in a negative 1 on the x. If you hit right on your gamepad, it's going to hit a 1 on the x in this vector2. We also don't want this to show up in the inspector, so let's give that a hide in inspector. Next, we need to enable the controls. So on enable, we're going to say controls.enable. And we need to do the same thing in on disable. And next, we want to make sure that we are sending whatever this value is getting into this move input. So we're going to say controls dot what did we call it movement dot move dot performed plus equals context send that into move input and we're going to read the value vector two 
So this syntax is a little bit confusing, but essentially what you are doing is grabbing what these inputs are and you're sending them into your move input variable. And that's all we need for this script. But because this is a mono behavior, it needs to actually sit on something in the game view. So what we're going to do is create a new empty, let's call it game manager. Let's reset the transform and add user input on top of that. Okay, so now we are actually able to read our input properly. So let's go ahead and get our character moving around on the screen. Click character, go down here to add component, and let's create a player class. Let's stay nice and organized. Go over here to your assets, drag player into scripts, and inside scripts, let's create another folder called player and throw it in there. I'm just going to rename that to player in all caps so it's a little easier to find. Let's go ahead and open this up. Let's go ahead and get rid of this stuff here. So we're going to move the character by updating the velocity of the character's rigid body that we added. So let's first grab a reference to the rigid body. Private rigid body 2D, let's call it RB. And in our start function, let's grab that reference. And in our update function, we are going to use a move function that we now need to create. Now we want to grab a reference to our move input over in the user input script. So let's create a private float move input. And down in move, move input is going to be equal to user input dot instance dot move input dot x. This is a 2D platformer, so we don't really care about the Y. We only care about left and right. So now we have our X value from our user input, and now we can pass that in as our velocity. And let's give that a speed. We'll just throw in seven and a half for now. We'll change that in just a second. But for our Y, let's go ahead and just pass in what the velocity of the Y is so that we're not interfering with that. So up here, there's no need to make it public. What we can actually do is serialize the field of the private type float. We'll call it move speed. And we'll swap this number in with move speed instead. Let's give that a default value of 7.5. Remember to put the F on the end if it's a float. Save your script with control S and let's go back into Unity and make sure that that's working. If you saved your script like I did before you put in the default, then you're going to see that you've got a zero in your inspector here. So let's just add that in and try again. Great. Next, what I would like to do is get him turning in the direction that he's moving. So let's set that up now. Go back to your player script. So what I would like to be able to do is to dynamically check which direction the player is turning in start. So to do that, let's add serialized field, private game object left leg and again for the right leg let's go back to the inspector and add those in now drag in the right leg from the player down here and the left leg like so and what we're going to do is add a function called start direction check so we want to check if the x position of the right leg is greater than the left leg then he's facing right leg.transform.position.x is greater than left leg .transform .position x. Then let's go up here and create a public bool called is facing right. Again, we don't need to see this in the inspector. So let's put hide in inspector. We just want it to be public in case we ever want to be able to access this from another script. So back down to start direction check. If the right leg transform position.x is greater than the left legs, then we will say that is facing right is equal to true. Else is facing true is equal to false. Now let's call this in our start function. So as soon as we load up the scene now, it's going to run this and it's going to dynamically decide whether our character is facing right or not. We already know that the player is facing right, but sometimes with different asset packs, you might actually have characters that start facing the left. And that can be a bit of a pain when you've got all this movement code running. Now that we know what direction he's facing, we can actually start working in some turn code. So let's add a function called private void turn check. So we're going to say if user input dot instance dot move input dot x is greater than zero and 
is facing right is equal to false. Or an easier way to write this is to get rid of that and just put an exclamation mark at the beginning. And is facing right is equal to false. So our x is greater than zero, which means we're pushing right on the keyboard, but our character is facing left. This means we want to turn the character. And else if user input dot instance dot move input dot x is less than zero, so you're pushing left on your keyboard and the player is facing right, then we also want to turn. So let's go ahead and create that turn function now. Private void turn. Let's throw that in here. And here we're going to say if is facing right. The way that I actually want to turn him is to rotate on the Y axis by 180 degrees. That'll get him facing left. And if he's facing right, we just want that to be zero. So we're going to create a vector three called rotator. That's going to be a new vector three. The X is going to remain the transform.position.x. The Y is 180 degrees. And the Z is also going to remain transform. I apologize, rotation.z. Change that over here. So that's the actual vector three that we want to plug into the inspector. So we're going to say transform.rotation is equal to quaternion.euler. And we'll plug in our vector three rotator that we just created. And finally, let's change this bool value to be what it was not before. So is facing right is equal to not is facing right. All this is going to do is flip what it was before. So that's if the character was facing right. Else, let's go ahead and copy all that code. Except instead of 180, we want that to be zero. Now finally, you can see we're calling this twice right here. You can see it's right here, but turn check is not actually being called. So we actually want to go back up to our move function and add something in there. If move input is greater than zero or move input is less than zero. So if you're pressing left or right, then we'll do a turn check. You could put this in the update function, but there's no need to run this every single frame. There's only a need to run it when we're actually turning left and right. So let's go ahead and test this. Great. So now let's actually get him animating to make this look a whole lot better. If you don't have the animator tab open, go to window, animation, animation, not animator, animation. We'll dock that down here beside the game view. Now with your player selected, click create here. We're going to click on our assets folder and create a new folder called animation. Now let's actually get an idle going before we create a walk. So we'll call it idle. So let's add a property and let's add our body's transform position. Before we start, I'm actually going to drop my player onto the floor. That'll make animating the walk cycle a lot easier. So idle is always going to be a looping animation. So let's go ahead and click on those keyframes there. Hit control C and let's go over to frame 20 and control V to make sure that they're the beginning and the end are the same. Let's go to frame 10, hit the record button over here and we'll move the body up just a little bit. So already if you hit play, you can see what's happening. Make sure that you don't have secret hidden keyframes over at the one second mark. If you do delete those out, you hit play. This should be looping nicely now. Now let's also get his head in there. Because we clicked record, you can actually just go over here, click head, and you can actually just move it down. It'll automatically add the beginning and those keyframes there. And at frame 15, let's move his head back up a bit. Make sure you copy your beginning frames into the end again. Let's see how it looks. You can adjust that until it's how you like it. Now, one thing that I forgot actually is the player's weapon. Let's go ahead and stop this now and add that in right now. Go back to sprites, tutorial asset pack, go down to player and your scythe will be in there. Before we drag that into the scene, let's go into the sprite editor and make sure that you move your pivot point down to the base there. What the pivot point does is controls where this image actually rotates from. We want it to rotate from the bottom, not from the center. Click apply. And now you can drag that into your hierarchy. And let's make that a child of the body game object. And let's get it positioned the way that we want. The scythe should be rendered on top of everything else. So let's make this a six. And you can see if you go back to your animation, because we parented the scythe to the body, it's already moving along with the body up and down. Now back into our animation at frame 10, let's rotate the scythe back just a little bit. And finally at frame five, let's squash the head a little bit and at 15 we'll stretch it a little bit. So you can click head, click on the scale tool, 
Gonna squash it down and widen it a little bit and stretch that a little bit. Again, play with those values until you're happy with them. Okay, so that is our idle. And actually, you'll notice if you hit play, it's already going to be animating with that animation by default. That is because in the process of setting up the animation, Unity went ahead and added an animator component to our player with a controller called player, which got saved into the same folder as our idle animation. Next, let's set up a walk cycle. Click on your player, go over here and click on create new clip. And I'm just gonna disable the background for a minute so that I can see what I'm doing a little bit better. So on our very first frame, I actually want the legs to be split apart. Make sure you hit the record button, go ahead and rotate the right leg and move it back up there. Same thing with the left leg. This animation is gonna be 30 frames long, so go ahead and copy and paste those beginning frames onto frame 30. And at frame 15, we're just gonna split the legs apart, but in the opposite direction. Go ahead and hit play and see how that looks. Great, so let's get this looking a little bit better. Let's rotate the scythe back just slightly at frame 15. Now we just created the contact poses for the walk cycle. So what we're gonna do now is create the down pose. So at frame four, we're gonna move the body down just slightly and up slightly at frame 10. Copy and paste those at frame 20 so that they should be on frame 20 and 26. Let's see how that looks. Make sure your beginning frames are the same at the end looking a lot better already and if you want we can also get the head squashing and stretching a little bit on the down and up poses so the down we'll squash him just a bit and we'll stretch him just a bit here copy and paste those at frame 20 as well let's see how that looks and let's also get his head rotating back just a little bit at frame 15. And again, make sure that your beginning and ending frames are the same. Great, so we have the idle animation and we have the walk animation. And if you play your game, the idle animation is always going to be playing on a loop. And no matter what we do, we can't get the other one to play because we need to do that by code. So first, let's open up the animator window and create the parameters that we need. So let's go to animation, this time animator. I like to dock it up here. So you can see the idle is already in there with a transition from entry. It's orange, which means it is the default animation. So what we want to do is create a transition from idle to walk. So right click idle, make transition, go to walk and we'll make a transition from walk back to idle as well. Click on parameters and let's create a bool and we'll call it is walking. So in order to go from idle to walk, we're going to set the condition is walking equals true and to go from walk back to idle, is walking should be false. Now on both of them, let's make sure that we uncheck has exit time, change the transition duration to zero. Now this parameter that we created is actually accessible to us through code and we can manipulate it. So let's do that next. Open up your player script. We first need to get a reference to the animator component. Let's call it anim and get a reference to that in the start function. So we actually have this already set up pretty nicely for us. We already have a function within move that says if we are moving right or we are moving left, what we can do is just add in there anim.setbool going to want a string from you so type it in exactly as you typed it you can go back to the inspector and double click and control c if you want put that in there and we're going to set is walking equal to true we're going to add an else so if we're not moving left and right then anim.setbool is walking is equal to false let's test this Great, so now our character is walking around, he's turning and he's doing his idle animation when he's not moving and he's doing his walk animation when he is moving. Awesome. You can actually see that my, as I'm walking around, my feet are not quite touching the floor. This is a problem with the animation itself that I created. So if I want to fix that, I can just move the feet down a little bit on the walk cycle. 
So if you click on floor over here and you hit edit collider, you'll see the green line of where the player is actually going to be colliding with the ground. The player's green line here, which I'll actually move down just slightly, will be colliding with the floor line here. So if I move my character down just a hair and go to the walk cycle, you can see that his feet are not touching the ground. So let's fix that. So I fixed it in the starting frames and in the ending frames. Let's also fix it in the middle. That's looking a little better anyways. 